In this lecture, we will discuss the differences between the different substitution and elimination mechanisms. We will talk about how to predict the relative rates of these different mechanisms, as well as the differences in product that can result from these different mechanisms. We will start by learning how to predict which mechanisms will predominate. Remember that whichever mechanisms happen fastest will predominate and will lead to the major products. In determining the relative rates of the different mechanisms, there are several components of the reaction that we can consider. First, let's talk about the base or nucleophile strength. The strength of the base or nucleophile that is present will help to determine the order of the reaction. If we have a strong nucleophile or base present, it will determine that a second order mechanism will occur. A strong base or nucleophile causes the second order mechanism to occur very quickly. In other words, a strong base will abstract a proton, or a strong nucleophile will attack the electrophilic carbon faster than the substrate can ionize. Therefore, the reaction will most likely go by a second order mechanism. If the base or nucleophile is weak, this will mean that most likely the mechanism will be first order, either E1 or SN1, or perhaps a mixture of both. This is not because a, a weak base or nucleophile promotes a first order reaction, but rather that it slows the second order mechanisms so much that the first order become faster than the second order meaning that E1 or SN1 will likely predominate. The next factor that we will consider in predicting the relative rates of these different mechanisms is the substrate structure. Primarily what we're talking about here is the substitution of the substrate. Remember that a good leaving group favors all of the mechanisms and therefore will not favor one over the others. The SN1 and E1 mechanisms prefer tertiary substrates. This is due to the increased stability of the carbocation that is formed from a tertiary alkyl halide. The E2 mechanism also prefers a tertiary substrate. However, this is due to Zaitsev's rule. The more substituted alkene product is more stable and therefore forms more quickly. The SN2 mechanism prefers unhindered substrates. Therefore, methyl substrates will react most quickly, and tertiary substrates will not re react at all. Therefore, depending on the substitution of the substrate, we can make some predictions about which mechanisms will predominate. If the substrate is a methyl halide, then most commonly the SN2 mechanism will predominate because all of the other mechanisms prefer more substituted substrates. Additionally, it's important to note that the elimination mechanisms cannot occur with a methyl substrate, because there is no neighboring carbon from which to abstract a proton. If the substrate is primary, it will most commonly react through the SN2 mechanism, although depending on the other factors, will sometimes react through the E2 mechanism. Secondary substrates are the hardest to predict. We will likely need to consider all of the other factors in order to determine which mechanism or mechanisms predominate with a secondary substrate. Tertiary substrates will typically react through an E2 mechanism if we have a strong base, or a mixture of SN1 and E1 if there is a weak base or nucleophile. The next factor we will consider is the structure of the nucleophile or base. Many strong nucleophiles are also strong bases and vice versa. Therefore we need to go beyond the strength of the base or nucleophile in order to determine which mechanism or mechanisms will predominate. The first thing we will consider is the substitution of the nucleophile or base. This concept is relatively straightforward. A more hindered nucleophile or base will prefer elimination. The reason for this is that the protons on the molecule are more easily accessible than the carbons 
since the protons surround the molecule and surround the atoms they're bonded to. The protons are more accessible, and therefore if we have a bulkier nucleophile or base, it is much more easily going to reach the protons, which are on the outside of the molecule, rather than the electrophilic carbons, which are on the inside of the molecule, and therefore harder to access. Conversely, a less hindered nucleophile or base will prefer substitution. This is because a less hindered nucleophile can more easily bypass the exterior protons and attack the electrophilic carbons within. The other factor to consider concerning the structure of the nucleophile or base is the property of basicity and how it is not the same as nucleophilicity. While most strong bases are good nucleophiles and most strong nucleophiles are good bases, this isn't always the case. There are some weak bases that are still very good nucleophiles, and these compounds will much prefer substitution over elimination. Take a moment and pause the video and see if you can determine any of these compounds that are weak bases but good nucleophiles. An example of a strong nucleophile that is a weak base is something like bromide ion or iodide ion. These compounds are weak bases, but very good nucleophiles. Because of this, reactions that involve these particular nucleophiles will not have competing E2 reactions, because the SN2 reactions will be much faster. There are two other factors to consider when determining which of the four mechanisms will predominate. The first is solvent. Remember that polar solvents are good for both types of elimination and substitution mechanism because they're good at solubilizing the reactants. Also remember that polar protic solvents tend to favor the first order mechanisms because polar protic solvents are good at stabilizing the charged intermediates and transition states that form in these first order mechanisms. Conversely, Polar aprotic solvents tend to favor second-order mechanisms. Having protic solvents around hinders second-order mechanisms because it weakens the base or nucleophile. Polar aprotic solvents don't have this drawback. The final factor to consider is the presence of silver ion. Remember, as we saw in lab, that silver ion can help to ionize compounds and can sometimes force ionizations where they wouldn't normally occur. Therefore, the presence of silver ion can help to force first order mechanisms. Now we will discuss the differences between the mechanisms and how that can affect the structures that we see in the products. The first thing we will consider is rearrangements. Remember that when we say rearrangements, what we mean is the rearrangement of the carbocation. Therefore, this can only occur in first order mechanisms because the carbocation is only formed in first order mechanisms. Remember that you can recognize that a rearrangement has occurred in a substitution reaction because substitution will occur at a different carbon than the leaving group was attached to. In elimination, we can assume a rearrangement has occurred when the double bond forms and it involves carbons that are different than the carbon that contained the leaving group. The second thing we will consider is the stereochemistry of the products and how that is affected by mechanism. Remember that both of the second order mechanisms are stereospecific. If we start with one stereoisomeric reactant, we will get a single stereoisomer of the product. This is not true for the first order mechanisms. Both of the first order mechanisms go through a planar carbocation, which means that if we start with a specific stereoisomer of the reactant, we will get a mixture of stereoisomers in the product. Therefore, if we start with a chiral reactant, and the product can have multiple stereoisomers, both E1 and SN1, which proceed through the planar carbocation, will lead to a mixture of stereochemical products.
SN2 alternately will proceed with inversion of stereochemistry at the reactive carbon center. E2 requires an anti-arrangement of the proton that is being abstracted and the leaving group. This will result in the production of a single stereoisomer product.